Thank you. Well, that was the promo video for our exhibition, The American Dream Pop to the Present, um, which uh, was uh, uh, specifically commissioned for the exhibition. The American Dream was the culmination of a long-term commitment to building an important collection of modern and contemporary American prints at the British Museum. The desire to form such a collection started with my predecessors, Anthony Griffiths and Francis Carey, who in 1980 mounted a survey exhibition of 100 years of American printmaking from Whistler to Richard Estes. During the intervening period, and so over the past 35 years, the American collection at the, at the museum continued to expand. And I show here, this is the print room um, of the British Museum with students coming to look at material in the collection. And as you can see, they're looking at quite small prints. Um, and this is something that, by and large, American prints, uh, are, modern American prints, are not. Um, in America, size matters. And um, this is, uh, has put on certain, certain pressures on our, uh, on our storage and um, um, how we can access the material and pr bring them up to students who wish to see them in the, collect in the prints and drawing study room. By 2008, we were well placed to put on a more focused exhibition called The American Scene which covered printmaking of the first half of the 20th century from John Sloan of the, and the Ashcan School of the 1900s to Jackson Pollock and the Abstract Expressionists of the 1950s. The success of this show provoked a clamor from both the public and the critics for a sequel to bring the story of American printmaking up to the present day. And the critic Robert Hughes, uh, writing in The Guardian, reviewing the American scene exhibition, he gave a two-page spread uh, to this exhibition, concluded how one wishes that the British Museum could improve its holdings in American printmaking from the 1960s and after. Well, it was a challenge, um, but we managed, I think. Um, and in the past eight, uh, nine years, um, we have concentrated our efforts in um, building up a collection um, that could do this justice. And so in 2017, we were able to stage the American Dream in the new purpose-built Sainsbury Exhibition Gallery just off the great court of the museum. Um, this great huge space, which is like a, an aircraft hangar. Um, um, it was the first print show ever to be held there and gave the print primacy. Both these two exhibitions, the American Scene and the American Dream, were conceived to complement each other. Both were divided into 12 sections, thematic chronological sections, with the accompanying catalogues intended to provide an historical survey of American printmaking from a transatlantic perspective. So this is, um, uh, there's a certain distancing from um, uh, from America. This had never been attempted in London before. The American Dream covers the period from Andy Warhol and the pop artists of the 1960s to the present day. Its aim is to tell the story of American art through its expression in printmaking over the past six de decades, from the moment pop art burst onto the New York and West Coast scenes in the early 1960s, through the rise of minimalism, conceptual art, and photorealism in the 1970s, to the practice of artists working today. It was a period characterized by the production of works of an unprecedented scale, which is one reason why the exhibition could not be shown in our regular prints and drawings gallery, and instead in this massive um, Sainsbury exhibition space. Um, unprecedented scale, boldness, and ambition. From the 1960s, a growing affluent middle class fed the market for prints, one that was seized upon by enterprising publishers and print workshops with artists encouraged to create prints within the collaborative environment of state-of-the-art workshops that had just been established 
on the east and west coasts. During this period, artists were increasingly using the parent to address contemporary political and social issues, such as race, AIDS and feminism, as well as to comment on momentous events such as the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the first landing of man on the moon in 1969. Changing notions of the American dream run as a thread through the exhibition from Warhol's exposure of its illusionary nature, seen in the Marylands, to Ed Ruscha's reflections on its decay, and shown here in the final room. Throughout all these changes, America's ingenuity, enterprise, and chaotic energy remain as an abiding theme, its restless power and capacity, capacity for renewal. The British Museum version of the exhibition showed well over 200 prints. What you see here is um, just, um, just over about a half, uh, interspersed with, interrelate, with related works in other media. And over 70% of the prints came from the museum's own collection, nearly 100 of which were acquired in the last 10 years. To enable us to do this, we had to identify key acquisitions that would tell this story as cogently as possible. And so what I'm going to do now is just to show you some of the key acquisitions that were made um, in this period. Um, and here is um, uh, Catherine Daunt and myself, Catherine who worked very closely with me on the exhibition, um, holding up uh, the, one of the uh, the, the, um, the Andy Warhol's uh, Vote McGovern, which had just been acquired, and two other works, um, one by Ed Ruche, Made in California, and Wayne Tebow's Gumball Machine. And here you see them in, in the print room um, that you saw earlier. Um, Booster was on our list. And, for, for, and came in quite late um, in uh, 2016. Um, and we were able to acquire this at auction in New York. And um, this work um, at the time in 1967 was the largest hand printed lithograph. It shows, um, it's a self portrait. It's Rauschenberg standing naked bar except for his um, boots, he's standing in his Texan boots. Um, and overlaying that is a star chart. So it's a combination of both the um, terrestrial and the extraterrestrial. Um, and um, it's, it's life size, so it's really an, Im an impressive work produced at the Gemini workshop on the West Coast uh, with Ken Tyler, the master printer. And now, I have to say, you'll see that it was purchased with funds given by the Vollard Group. And in order to be able to, to do, undertake this um, um, program of um, um, acquisitions, um, given that the budget for uh, acquisitions at the British Museum is um, just under £10,000 per year, and is supposed to cover the period from the 15th century up to the present day. Um, it, 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 you wouldn't think this was impossible. Um, and, so, um, and so six years ago, I formed a group called the Vollard Group, um, which is um, a dedicated group to the modern collection, post-1945, to acquire key works. I have just over 30 members and the contrib annual contributions that they make uh, enable me to make these acquisitions for the museum. And in addition to that, of course, it's the generosity of uh, collectors, um, um, uh, 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 artists, and institutions that have also enabled us to build this collection uh, in this way. And, and here I'd like to draw attention to this um, key work by Jasper Johns, which was acquired 
um, very recently as a gift from the American collectors, Joanna and Leslie Garfield. And, um, <clears throat> and another major work, uh, not shown here, because it's too large, it wouldn't fit on in uh, the lift here, so we weren't able to bring it to, to, to Paris. It's um, some nine feet wide, um, three and a half feet tall. It's by Willie Cole, African-American artist, called Stowage, produced just over 20 years ago, 1997. Um, and what you see in the center there um, is um, a sort of diagrammatic um, representation of a slave ship. Um, Willie Cole was inspired by a little diagram that he saw as a schoolboy growing up um, in his um, textbook showing um, a diagram on, produced by the abolitionists um, in the 17, eight, late 1780s showing the um, the cutaway of the um, hold where the slaves were kept or um, shackled. And um, so Willie Cole has used an ironing board in the center um, as his matrix, and around it are blocks of wood in which he has cut out um, holes and inserted the undersides of um, steam irons and, um, and the steam irons, the vents from the steam irons, suggest um, scarification. Um, um, of course, the steam iron also suggests branding. So you have this um, an extraordinary work produced in a very small edition, some 16, um, 12 of which are in museum collections in the United States. And we were extremely fortunate to be able to acquire this from the publisher who had retained one, and it's the only example um, out, out in a public collection outside the United States. Um, I want also to show you uh, some of the, the way in which we installed the exhibition at the British Museum. Um, as I said, um, it was divided into 12 sections, and each room was distinctive. It would, from the very outset, uh, we decided that we weren't going to show these prints in 12 cubes. Um, it would just be too uh, monotonous for a visitor to go from um, um, one, one similar room to the next. Uh, and instead, um, we chose to go with color. Um, and this is the opening room, uh, pop art, um, with the electric chairs on the left. Um, the great Rosenquist uh, F-111, which was given to uh, the British Museum by Dave and Reba Williams in honor of Anthony Griffiths for his years of service as its keeper. Um, and you'll also see up here, um, uh, up, up in the upper right corner, um, a sculpture by Klaus Oldenburg, which we borrowed from the Tate. And we wanted to show the interrelationship, where possible, between these prints and um, paintings and sculpture and um, neon, in the case of uh, Bruce Nauman, um, here and there throughout the exhibition, to show how artists were pursuing their imagery across media. Um, here are a few. Um, the section called The Three Giants of American Printmaking. Um, all three artists, Jasper Johns, Rausch Robert Rauschenberg, and um, Jim Dine, all began in 1960, um, initially at the um, Universal Limited Art Editions on the East Coast with Titania Grossman, the print publisher. And lat then later, in the mid from the mid-60s, many of them worked um, with Ken Tyler at Gemini in Los Angeles on the West Coast. We borrowed, too, for the exhibition in London, um, and we had very generous loans from the National Gallery of Art Washington, which has the entire uh, Gemini archive, 
And here you see um, the, um, the color numerals um, for, produced by Jasper Johns, the Klaus Oldenburg's um, profile airflow, and um, one of the, the textile hoarfrosts by uh, Robert Rauschenberg. The variety of production at the uh, Gemini Arc, um, workshop is a and the ambition and boldness is something that really characterizes the works um, from this period. Um, the West Coast was also a very important theme, and here we went for orange on the walls um, to tie in with Made in California, which you saw in the third slide um, by Ed Ruscher. Um, we also included artist books, a few of them, uh, the key work by um, uh, Ed Ruscher, 26 gasoline stations, and also every building on the Sunset Strip. And there you see the Sunset Strip um, stretched out um, in that vitrine. Um, another feature of the exhibition was the inclusion of documentary material in the forms of clips, newsreels, um, which was about a third of the way through the exhibition so people could get a sense of the context in which these works were produced. Um, and there would be a, con there would be a work um, from the exhibition or a detail such as the Emma Amos on the left and um, something comparable um, on the right, uh, something that would speak to it, as in this case, a Martin Luther King. The exhibition, um, each, as I said, each room was, was re we, unlike here, where uh, your, the space is given. Um, here we had to construct each room with a space uh, with uh, an attempt to show works um, backwards, uh, going back, looking back, uh, as well as forward and also across. Um, here in the minimalist conceptual room uh, is um, a sculpture by Al Taylor which we borrowed from a collection in Munich, private collection, and two works, one drawing and one print by Al Taylor which connect with this hanging puddles. And minimalism here with a stack of Donald Judd woodcuts um, uh, on the wall on the right. And then having gone through the, the principal um, art movements, um, the last third of the exhibition considered a certain um, uh, presiding themes, um, politics and dissent. And this is here, it opens with um, um, Andy Warhol's Vote McGovern, um, Chris Burden's Atomic Alphabet, Jim Dine's um, um, uh, Drag, uh, the Mao by uh, Andy Warhol. AIDS and, um, was an, an important theme. Also um, works that we either borrowed or had purchased. David Wonjurovic in the on the um, uh, the projection projecting side there. Uh, Keith Herring obviously on the on the left. We borrowed from the Victorian Albert Museum, and at the back. Um, the very big Kiki Smith um, called Bourne, which we purchased for the collection. And here is a, a group of works, some, some borrowed, some purchased. Uh, the first, the upper two, May Stevens um, purchased uh, for the museum, and um, uh, Kiki Smith's Bourne. The other two, um, Louise Bourgeois on loan, to us from a private collection which is coming to the museum. And that's also very satisfying that um, working with particular collectors uh, who have promised their collection to, uh, collections to the British Museum, um, which is a, a really um, a, a very good strategy because it means that um, one doesn't have to um, focus on those areas when you know that eventually these will come to the collection in time. Um, and the last two rooms were devoted to uh, race and identity. Here, the Willie Cole, which I showed to you earlier, 
and Kara Walker um, with those uh, silhouettes um, on the back wall, preceded by Andy Warhol's um, 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 Alabama, Birmingham, Birmingham Race Riots in Alabama. Um, that work we borrowed from We Don't Own and um, we borrowed that from the Warwick University Art Museum. And then lastly, um, the signs of the times. Um, and you'll see here um, how there is a cutaway. You can see on that back wall there, you'll see two uh, rusty signs by Ed Ruscher, which are in the exhibition and here, and also uh, his ghost station, which is a reprise of his famous work, Standard Station, which we had borrowed from the Museum of Modern Art, New York. And um, we devised it in such a way that we could, at the end of the exhibition, there's a cutaway to look back through to the um, Standard Station um, and make that connection between 1966, the period of great optimism, um, can do, uh, and perhaps a, a more um, muted reflection on things uh, today. I mean, Ed Ruscher, uh, understandably, ha doesn't declare his intentions, um, but the ghost station, um, which is an inkless embossed um, print by a special method of making uh, done in Los Angeles, um, does reflect, I think, the, um, the, the end, perhaps, of fossil fuel, the closure of gasoline stations, um, the sort of sense of change. And finally, um, on the right here, we have work by Julie Meirutu, uh, which is um, very uh, recent, a set of five um, etchings uh, which show things in a state of flux, movement backwards and forwards. Um, she's an Afri uh, She's from born in Ethiopia, but uh, educated in America. And um, this sense of global change, um, things not being stable, is uh, was the way which we chose to end the exhibition rather than in anything more overtly uh, political. And finally, my last slide, and here I wish to uh, uh, pay tribute to uh, Catherine Daunt, who worked very closely with me on this exhibition, and, um, um, and also I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Susan Tolman, who contributed to the, to the catalogue with a major essay on the rise of the print workshops in the United States. And my final thanks is to the Terra Foundation for American Art, for supporting both this exhibition and its predecessor, the American scene, and to uh, the um, to Gerd Leighton for having us um, this exhibition here in uh, in Paris. Um, what is so marvelous is that each iteration, we've only had two, but they're different, and I think that's. Um, all to the good. I, I've shown you here how we did it, but downstairs you'll see how, that, uh, how you have done it. And um, I'd like very much to thank you and Katie for allowing us to, to, to show these works here in Paris. Thank you.